So trust and authenticity is what I'm here to talk to you about. And uh, how many people remember when Beyonce sang at the inauguration? I thought when I was watching it, I thought she did an awesome job. I was like, wow, she sounds really great. Um, which, you know, very soon after led to the, uh, well, it blew up on social media and across all these different news outlets later that evening that she hadn't actually sung live. She lip-synced the song. It was her singing, but she had recorded it earlier. And people were outraged. Outrage was the word that, that was used for it. People were really annoyed that she was dishonest with us. She didn't tell us what, what she was doing. I mean, she had an opportunity to be upfront, and she didn't choose to take that approach. And uh, this sort of got me thinking about the concept of trust and being authentic and why we actually care about that today. Um, so. Beyonce basically gave me my idea for this conversation. You know, as John mentioned earlier, we're in the relationship era, and relationships are really built on trust. So, you know, why is that important? I think it's important today, we care about authenticity and trust today even more because we have access to not just our own experiences, we have access to everyone's experience today. You know, in our organizations, people aren't using tools like this to get access to what someone else has, has done with us or the work that, uh, you know, the value or the quality of the work we're doing. But they do talk to each other. They talk to one another and they always ask someone else for advice before actually buying a service or signing up to, to, to be a client. Nielsen just found that 92% of people prefer uh, tr a trusted marketing or, or sort of a trusted source for their, uh, when they're, when they're looking at buying new services rather than any other form of, of communication. So they would rather ask a friend for a referral or do something like that where they're asking someone trusted. Um, so that, that's really where this sort of connected age has taken us. And what we want to do is we want to create an environment where people trust us because we care about something that they also care about. That's really where I want to encourage you to go today. So being authentic in my opinion, is really about being consistently uh, trustworthy and you know, being, giving something, give, uh, really caring about something that your clients also care about. So consumers, they're not, you know, they know what you're up to. They know that you're trying to sell them something, but they also, I think if you can convince your consumers that selling something is actually uh, a result of something you care about more, a bigger, broader thing, that's when, that's when you convince people that you're actually being authentic. You care about something that, that is bigger than just getting them to buy the, the item off the shelf or to buy the service that you're selling. Simon Sinek wrote this book, Starts With Why, and he has this concept called the golden circle. Um, it's not that complicated of a circle. <laughs> Um, and what he says is that every organization knows what they do. They know that they sell certain services and they know that sells, they sell certain products. And a lot of organizations and people within those organizations know how they do it. So they know that you know, the reason that, that we're able to sell this product is because of X, Y, or Z. This is our value proposition. It's what differentiates us from the next organization or what we think is at least important when you're considering working with us. But very few organizations know actually why they're doing what they're doing. And this is, I think, the most important point. So why do you actually come to work in the morning? Why does your business exist in the way it does? Why does it sell the services that it sells? What do you actually care about? And why should, another, why should your clients or the people you want to be your clients also care? What Simon says is, huh. <laughs> what Simon says is that the, the really inspired organizations, the really inspired leaders, they actually start on, on the inside of the circle. They start with the why. They know what their purpose is, and then they let that why, that purpose, inform everything on the way out. So they, that informs the approach that they take and how they differentiate themselves, how they provide value, and then it also informs what it is they're actually selling. So what I'm proposing today is that if you actually have a purpose, have something that you care about deeply, and that what you care about is something that your clients and your potential clients also care about, 
then you'll build that connection. They'll continue to trust you. And it's going to uh, it's going to create deeper relationships which lead to loyalty and, and also influencers. So let's take a look at an example from a Procter & Gamble company, Tide. We talked about Procter & Gamble a little bit earlier. Um, this is an advertisement from 1949. Uh, this ad is very clearly selling to you, right? It's about the product. It's about the fact that Tide can make your wash cleaner and whiter and brighter, and that's what women want, um, which they're not wrong. We want that. That's true. I think guys want that too, I'm not sure. Um, but, so, so you know, this, this, is, this is an ad that I think was from a time before where we are now, which is, uh, you know, after Mark Pritchard, the global marketing officer, really changed the course of the Procter & Gamble organization. He decided in 2010 that every business, every brand within the Procter & Gamble umbrella needed to have a purpose, and that purpose needed to be around the function of improving people's lives. So instead of actually focusing on marketing to people, which we often find ourselves doing across every business and every organization, he wanted people to, or the brands within the Procter & Gamble umbrella, to focus on serving people and making their lives better. So what does this mean for a laundry detergent? This is what an ad in 2013 looks like. Now this is, first of all, I just melt when I see this because I think it's so sweet. And what it does is it creates this connection. It creates an experience for me because I can actually imagine the afternoon where this father and his daughter go and pick out their outfits and he decided he's gonna wear the colander on his head. So ridiculous. Um, but the, <laughs> the idea that you, know, you can have this fun with your daughter and roll around in the grass and you don't have to worry about the, the grass stains at the end of it, you know, Tide in this case is a byproduct. You, buying Tide is sort of a byproduct of this larger experience that they've created for you. And they've created this idea of making your life better because this is easy. You don't have to worry about, you know, the repercussions of rolling in the, in the, in the grass with your daughter. Um, so when I think about this whole concept of authenticity and trust, you know, what I'm trying to convey today is that a, dr a, a brand that is driven by why, by that, that core of the golden circle, as Simon Sinek refers to it, they're driven by purpose and they care about something that their clients also care about. And that's how they build a connection with their clients. And in order to be authentic, you have to be consistent about what you care about. You have to consistently ex express that care in your actions, in your communications, in the way that you interact with your, your clients and your potential clients. It has to resonate consistently. When you do that, when you're authentic, it leads to people trusting you. And trusting, uh, trust builds strong relationships. Like I said, we're in the relationship era. That's a, that's a thing now. You know, um, when you have strong relationships, you get loyal followers who oftentimes talk about you to their, to their friends and their colleagues, and that's where, uh, that's where we want to be. And what I think is most interesting about this is that the only two things you have control over are at the top. You can care as a business, as, a, as marketers and business development uh, you know, roles and functions in these organizations. You can have a purpose, and you can care, and you can be consistent in the way that you express what you care about, but the rest of it's out of your control. So we really need to focus on figuring out what we care about and figuring out how we actually do that consistently. So let's take a look at an example. Two businesses that are very similar in, in the sense that they sell the exact same things, but they approach it in a completely different way. Zappos and Shoebuy.com. So Zappos really focuses on a purpose. They start with what they care about, which is delivering happiness. And I, as a consumer, can relate to that. I like being happy. They do this by providing the best customer service available or possible. Um, you know, they're, they're as an online shoe and clothing retailer. Now, shoe buy, when you try and when you dig into shoe buy, what you really get is the fact that they sell shoes. And their sort of their, their proposition to you is that it's easy to shop on shoebuy.com, but there's really no there's no reason to go to shoebuy.com. There's nothing that I should care about that they they seem to care about, other than really, you know, obviously making money. So when we look at these two organizations, they're pretty similar in terms of what they're selling. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to there being other organizations that are similar to you in terms of what they sell. They have similar policies and similar pricing, but their approach to it is completely different. Zappos has a focus on customer service. They want to wow me every single time I interact with them. 
They write handwritten thank you notes. When you, when you contact customer service at Zappos, you get a handwritten thank you note sometimes in the mail. Um, <laughs> which, is, which is weird, um, but awesome. It wows me. Um, they, have, you know, they have blogs about things that seem completely unrelated to shoes and bags and accessories, but at the same time they're interesting and they, they're, they're fun to read. They have events, they have a code of conduct. Now this is all stuff that Shoe Buy maybe has never even contemplated. It's just a website that sells shoes. And like Allison said earlier, when given the opportunity to choose uh, where to buy my shoes, if I had bought from Shoe Buy in the past, there's really no reason keeping me at Shoe Buy the next time. I'm very likely to go to the next, the next place if it happens to show up in my, in my searching. So is this successful? You know, for Zappos, they, have a, a, they focus on something, they care about something that actually resonates with their customers. And that leads to strong and lasting relationships. Now, Shoebuy, I think, has an authenticity problem. There's really nothing about Shoebuy that makes them different from the next site. They, even, they say they have an easy site, and I don't think it's even that easy. But there's really no reason for me to connect with Shoebuy at a deeper level. So can we measure this? Can we actually look and see if this is working? So if we look at, I took a couple different approaches to measurement. First, I just looked for reviews of the sites. And just at immediate first glance, you can see that people really are more satisfied with Zappos than they are with Shoebuy. It's not surprising, because I know a lot of you in the room love Zappos and are, and are thinking that right now. I'm looking at Don. Um, <laughs> Then you've got these loyalists, and not only loyalists, but evangelists. I think um, you, you search I love Zappos, and there are pages and pages of results on the web. You can even go to Pinterest, and there are tons of people who start Pinterest boards called I love Zappos. And their shoes are literally the same shoes that you could find on Shoebuy. It has nothing to do with the shoe. It has to do with the customer service, the fact that they care, and the fact that they've created this connection with me in the way that they treat me. So you may be wondering, what does this mean for professional services firms? Is this, is this even, is this, how does this relate? Well, McKinsey just put out a study that B2B companies, so B2B organizations, they don't even realize that their consumers care about honest and open dialogue with them. And in contrast, those consumers, that's the thing they care about the most. That's the 17 at the top out of all of the different things. We care most as consumers about having the organizations, the individuals like Beyonce that we interact with, we want them to be honest and open with us. So start with why and be cons figuring out what your purpose is, what you care about, and then being consistent to that develops a level of authenticity that creates trust with your, with your clients. So, what are some things that you can do? First of all, ensure that your communications feel real. I get this, this newsletter from the IE group about once a month, and every time I receive it, I get it twice. The first time I receive it, it's the same, mi same minute. It's obviously coming out through an automated process. The first time I receive it, it says, hi, Sarah. And the second time, it says, hi, Meyer. I can't delete this email fast enough. I never even read it. Um, you know, I did take a screenshot of it and put it up here, but then I deleted it. <laughs> Be a human. It, it, you know, when, you're, when you're sending out these communications to your clients and your prospective clients, it's okay to act as though you're an individual talking to another individual. This is an email from Marketing Profs. It's something that I subscribe to. And they recently sent out a newsletter they intended to send on Monday on a Saturday. I didn't even... I, not, alone did I, not only did I not know, but I didn't care. But they cared, they thought it was a big deal, and they sent this email saying, you know, we inadvertently sent out something on the wrong day. There was some great stuff in it. My favorite, by the way, was this one. I think you're gonna like it. I thought that was really nice. I actually felt like I was being spoken to by Anne, and she was talking directly to me. She wasn't, but it felt like it, and I appreciated that. When I go to the diner and I look at the menu of options, my expectation is that everything on the menu is going to be okay. It's not going to be bad. But I don't expect anything to blow my mind. Nothing's going to be great on this menu. Everything's got an equal level of emphasis. Think about the lists that we all have in our organizations. I think of a bio page 
uh, with you know, a lawyer who has 25 specialties. And to me, that's an authenticity problem. I don't think anyone can actually be an expert in 25 different things. Provide appropriate emphasis. Like understand the fact that when you provide equal emphasis on 100 different things, you're diminishing the value of every single, other, every single item on that list. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's really frustrating, personally, when I read these magazines, which I do, um, <laughs> and you get these titles on the front that, that get you excited about what you're going to read on the inside. Teenage train wrecks destroyed by their parents split. I can't wait to read more about that. But I'll tell you what, there is nothing more about that on the inside. They don't give you any more information, and that is frustrating. <laughs> So, <laughs> deliver what you promise. Think when you're writing titles, when you're, when you're talking about what you're doing, make sure that you're setting appropriate expectations. You're giving a sense of what's, go, what's to come and you're being appropriate and realistic about it. Don't call something global if it's only talking about three different locations, for example. Have a consistent personality. So this is Brooks Brothers on the left-hand side. I know you can't read any of this. On the left-hand side, we've got their blog of rogues and gentlemen, and on the right-hand side you have their, their Twitter feed. And Brooks Brothers is consistent with their formal and proper personality across both platforms, but they're leveraging the prop platforms appropriately and differently. On the, on the right-hand side on the Twitter feed they say, if you would kindly send us your username and reweaving may be an option, sir. And on the right-hand side they have articles like the ball is in your court and the right note. So you get the same sense of their personality, but it's being handled differently because the medium is different. They understand that there's a different way to talk to people across each of these. So when you think about the activities that you do, think about whether there are things you are doing already that you can, uh, that you can use to help exemplify and uh, sort of represent your purpose. Examine the tone and thoughtfulness of your email communications. Create personal experiences with people. Tailor your content to suit the audience and the platform. You are welcome to treat different people in different ways. So if I just signed up for the event next week, don't send me another reminder about signing up for the event next week. And have a personality. Be consistent to your personality. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's another way that people start to get to know you and, and feel connected. If you care about something that other people also care about and you let that inform your actions and your activities and the way that you communicate to them, that's how you'll build a deeper connection and that's how you'll generate trust and that's what will lead to your, uh, your long lasting and uh, your deep relationships. Authenticity is the benchmark against which all brands are now judged and uh, it's something that we all have control over and we should, we should be working towards it. <laughs>